Welcome to the seventh episode of the Invisible Iconic podcast, Adenomyosis and New Technologies. Today on the podcast, I am very, very grateful and very excited to have Dr. Gabby Moawad from the United States. So, Dr. Moawad, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what is adenomyosis and how many types of it exist? Thank you for having me. I'm really grateful to be able to be part of these wonderful podcast. I'm Gabi Mawad. I'm a gynecologic surgeon that specializes in uh, uh, endometriosis uh, and adenomyosis. I uh, work from Washington, D.C. and from Miami as well. Basically, we take care of all the complex pelvic pain, adenomyosis, and endometriosis patients. And today, I'm super happy to talk to you about adenomyosis, considering that we've done Lots and lots of publication and work on adenomyosis for the past couple of years. Uh, let me start the, simply with the definition because it's still very, very confusing, the definition of adenomyosis. It is very similar to the definition of endometriosis. We have some glands and stroma, which are features of uh, endometriosis-like tissues that are present within the muscle of the uterus. There are some definitions they say that the endometrium invaginated within the muscle of the uterus, which could be correct in some cases of what, what we refer to traumatic adenomyosis. Like, for example, patients who have multiple dilatation and curtage, DNCs, patients who have uh, surgeries, a lot of surgeries on the muscle of the uterus, like uh, sections or myomectomies have a higher chance of having adenomyosis than other patients who did not have. But most definitely, we still have very poor understanding about adenomyosis, its subtypes. Recently, there have been lots of work led by uh, Katarina Exacustos, uh, Tina Tellem from uh, Norway, that try to classify adenomyosis based on ultrasound features and on type. Basically, adenomyosis are divided into two major categories. We have the diffuse adenomyosis and the focal adenomyosis. The focal adenomyosis, when it is located in the anterior aspect of the muscle of the uterus, the posterior aspect, the diffuse when it is diffused throughout uh, the endometrium. Now, from those, we have different subtypes, sometimes focal adenomyosis, could be cystic adenomyosis or diffuse adenomyosis could be cystic when there are cysts that contain chocolate that are present inside uh, the uterus or in the proximity of the endometrium or the lining inside the uterus. We call them subendometrial cysts. Sometimes adenomyosis only affect the outer surface of the or the outer portion of the muscle of the uterus we call those foam or focal adenomyosis on the outer myometrium these typically are associated at a high percentage 70 percent maybe with deeply infiltrative endometriosis there are adenomyosis that presents as the thickening of the junctional zone which is an area between the lining of the uterus and the inner portion of the myometrium. This junctional zone used to be the determinator whether you do have adenomyosis or not, because they did a study where it showed measurements of that junctional zone more than 12 millimeter are highly associated with adenomyosis. But now there are multiple recent study and recent work that showed the junctional zone could contribute to adenomyosis, but there are a lot of missed adenomyosis if you utilize only the junctional zone as the sole measure, because even normal junctional zone measurement could be associated with adenomyosis. Uh, subendometrial cysts are better predictor of adenomyosis. Uh, uh, there are multiple other irregular junctional zone, multiple other features or we call them soft markers of adenomyosis and strong markers of adenomyosis on uh, the ultrasound or even the MRI. Unfortunately, a lot of radiologists still utilize the junctional zone as the sole diagnostic measure of adenomyosis. That's why very important. 
combining the symptoms with the expert uh, viewing the images or doing the images like an ultrasound would yield to higher accuracy in the diagnosis of adenomyosis. It's a super long uh, introduction, but I, I guess like this is the real problem with adenomyosis. A lot of us don't know many things about adenomyosis and what we know scientifically, it's very confusing. That's why I try to simplify it. You were speaking a new language to me, Dr. Moawad. There was a lot of things I hadn't even heard of before. In fact, I wanted to ask you specifically about adenomyomas as well. Well, adenomyomas are referred when you have a focal adenomyosis in one area that resembles to a fibroid, that it could be like uh, very similar to a fibroid, yet it's not a fibroid, it's an adenomyosis. It could be cystic or it could be a chocolate cyst within the muscle of the uterus, or it could be confused with a fibroid, a degenerated fibroid. But eventually, on ultrasound, it might be hard to differentiate, but on MRI, the differences are very obvious uh, of focal adenomyoma. But focal adenomyoma are a rarer form of adenomyosis, if I might say, because most of the adenomyosis could be either focal or diffuse. Rarely, they are like isolated one uh, lesion of adenomyosis within the muscle of the uterus. Thank you. I did have a clinical diagnosis of focal adenomyosis, and at first it wasn't seen in three surgeries. It wasn't seen on any of the imaging here in Australia. And then the deep infiltrating endometriosis MRI I had in Romania, that showed focal adenomyosis. And then when I came to Australia, it was seen on just a normal transvaginal ultrasound. Does that mean it's become more diffuse? If it becomes more evident on basic radiology like a TVUS? I'm going to tell you a secret about focal adenomyosis. Many times, a lot of radiologists confuses focal adenomyosis with uterine contractions. So when the uterus contracts, the junctional zone might appear thickened in one area. And then many radiologists call it focal adenomyosis, but this is not the, especially it happens a lot in younger patients. Uh, and then it's naturally not adenomyosis. Uh, it's just a uterine contraction that showed that the junctional zone is thickened only in one particular area. That's why uh, I would encourage a lot of patients who had the diagnosis of adenomyosis to have somebody that is experienced in diagnosing adenomyosis, whether on ultrasound or on MRI, to make the decision. Because as I mentioned, the traditional measurement tools, which is the junctional zone, showed to be an insufficient or more confusing in getting the diagnosis. For us, focal adenomyosis it doesn't affect, if we give it to patients, might not affect anything. But for the patient, uh, it's a burden of a diagnosis that they will carry all their life. That's the, uh, the, the, the difference. And that's why many times radiology are tools that we can utilize to our benefit to map the disease or confirm a disease, but it should not be the sole only determinant of uh, the diagnosis of a disease. We're treating patients. We're not treating images. We're not treating the radiology. If the patient have severe pain, severe bleeding, and the radiology is normal, that does not mean we should not do anything for the patient. We should strive to figure out like what's causing all this and how we can manage it, and vice versa. If the patient is asymptomatic, doesn't have anything, even if she has focal adenomyosis, it's not doing anything for her unless it is impacting their quality of life or uh, their daily life. So. Nowadays, we see a lot of diagnosis left and right, especially with adenomyosis, because we have advanced imaging. We, we see better pictures. We can detect different things. But still, uh, I believe that the diagnosis should not be only by a, a radiologic diagnosis. It should be a whole thing where we match the symptoms of the patient with the radiologic finding to give a diagnosis, or we go through a diagnostic criteria to ensure that we're not missing or we're not giving patients erroneous diagnosis or 
just a uh, uh, you know visual diagnosis on one cut of the MRI. So what are the common symptoms of adenomyosis and how do they differ from other conditions such as fibroids or endometriosis? Well, actually, you mentioned the two conditions that mimics adenomyosis at all time because adenomyosis have symptoms that mimic fibroids, which are abnormally termed bleeding, irregular bleeding, sometimes spotting, uh, a heavy period, and it mimics endometriosis in the fact that gives uh, pain during the period, pelvic pain, uh, heaviness, pain during bowel movement, pain during urination, pain during sex. Adenomyosis combines features from both uh, of the condition that you mentioned, fibroids and endometriosis. But adenomyosis, uh, the, the key to diagnosing adenomyosis is to see if it is associated with other pathologies like fibroids or endometriosis, because 40% of the time, adenomyosis is associated with endometriosis. And then in many times, uh, fibroids are a very common encounter. 85% of uh, patients have fibroids. Only 10% of those fibroids are symptomatic or cause problem or require surgical management. So uh, the majority of the fibroids are silent. Uh, so fibroids is a common encounter. So that's why when a patient is diagnosed with adenomyosis, mapping the whole muscle of the uterus and the surrounding is essential to rule out associated fibroids or associated endometriosis. So exactly how is adenomyosis diagnosed and how accurate are diagnosis methods in distinguishing adenomyosis from the other conditions we've just mentioned? Ultrasound and MRI are very, very powerful tools to diagnosing endometriosis and adenomyosis and fibroids. But unfortunately, the right tool in the wrong hands doesn't yield to the same results. So the ultrasound is operator dependent. If the uh, physician or the tech who are doing an ultrasound on a patient are not up to date with all the requirement diagnostic criteria, the understanding of the pathology, even if they see it, they won't notice it. Or they would call it erroneously based on, you know, outdated uh, uh, guidelines. Uh, MRI will go the same thing. The, the discrepancy or the blindness of the radiologist from the patient symptomatology most of the time would yield to uh, less attention to some areas where details must be taken care. And uh, also the uh, inappropriate training of surgeons to reading the MRIs would yield to missing a lot of other things. So I think ultrasound and MRI are very, very good tools that we have that helps us map any disease in the pelvis from the pelvic disease that we're talking about, endometriosis, adenomyosis, and fibroid, but also if it is utilized in a suboptimal way, it would lead to misdiagnosis uh, in a lot of cases. But the sensitivity of an MRI diagnosing adenomyosis is more than 95%, deeply infiltrative endometriosis, 95%, superficial peritoneal endometriosis, 65%, Fibroids is ninety more than 99% as well. So we have very powerful tools that should yield to the diagnosis easily. Now, confirmation of the diagnosis uh, is pathology many times, but uh, the clinical and uh, the, the radiology would help us make the diagnosis with high accuracy. The confirmation of the diagnosis is pathology, and many times we go back, the same problem that we have with an MRI, we have it with pathology, insufficient uh, uh, slices or insufficient samples from the specimen, older guidelines in diagnosing diseases that are still utilized. So unfortunately, this everybody works in silos and the system is so fragmented, but you need a leader that will you know, stand and advocate for their patients because many times I call the uh, radiologist when I know that the patient has adenomyosis, the symptom shows adenomyosis, the uh, MRI and the uterus is normal. I say like, oh, what about the adenomyosis? Oh, yes, 
Yes, you can call it here. Why didn't you mention in the pathology report? Can you run this? Can you take more slides? You know, so it's it's very important because at the end of the day, we cannot rectify the system unless we work all together uh, with the same understanding of the pathologies. And that's why in, in any hospital that I work in, I've purposefully uh, and then intentionally met with every single person that uh, deals with my patient pathologists, radiologists. So whenever they see my name, they know that I will hustle them if there is something missing or if I see something uh, that is different than them. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad that you do that. Not many people do follow up these sorts of things. But I also was thinking, as you were saying about the 95% accuracy, particularly in diagnosis of deep infiltrating endometriosis, I think it's really important to go back to that other point you made about all of this being operator dependent. Because you can have somebody using the best technology but if they're not even scanning the area that you are having symptoms in. So for example, in my case, I'm thinking of the sciatic endometriosis and a transvaginal ultrasound does not necessarily... Probably, it's completely uh, different than deeply infiltrated in the pelvis because uh, neuroradiology is different. We do a lot of neuropelviology. We based it mainly on patient symptomatology, on understanding uh, the neurophysiology, neuroanatomy, looking at sites. Because many times, it doesn't mean if you have a sciatic symptoms, that means you have endometriosis on the sciatic nerve. It could be in the vicinity or the proximity, irritating and then inflammating and stimulating the sciatic nerve. Many times, uh, the uh, the cuts of an MRI are between five and eight millimeters. Sometimes we can get them to be down with different skip lesions. That means then between the slices, how many millimeter they skip lesions. But unfortunately, a lot of patients comes with MRIs and a lot of patients already have MRIs done. A lot of hospitals are not willing to change their protocols. So uh, we need to work with whatever we can uh, but for pelvic deeply infiltrative endometriosis, the MRI is 95%. Now, I can tell you there are a lot of cases that are missed with the poor radiologist. There are a lot of cases that are overlooked with poor communication between the gynecologist and the radiologist. Because if I say endometriosis, he has the whole pelvis to look at. If I say rule out deeply infiltrative endometriosis on the sciatic nerve on the left side, then they will focus and look on the left side in a more accurate way. So simply the communication, because the radiologist never seen the patient, never examined the patient, does not see the patient in the room. The tech put the patient, the tech create pelvic MRI with and without contrast, put you in the MRI machine, do that, give it to the radiologist, you've gone home, the radiologist after two days reads it. So unless there is a clear communication and clear guidance and instruction from the gynecologist, the radiologist have a chance to missing a lot of things unless they're overly flagrant and big. But I don't think endometriosis of the sciatic nerve is going to be a 15 centimeter endometrioma on the sciatic. It's going to be uh, less than a centimeter, a uh, few millimeters, which makes it really hard to look in the the needle in the haystack uh, in the pelvis. The pelvis is an extremely complex uh, part of the body with a lot of vessels, a lot of nerves, and it's super easy, even with expert uh, radiologists, to miss things unless they're guided or instructed where to look and then uh, what kind of pathology they should rule out. Another challenge for the radiologist, I'm trying to be the devil's advocate, neuropelviology is a fairly recent, you know, science that if you talk about neurosurgeon or an orthopedic surgeon, which we think they deal with major nerves and uh, uh, they've never seen the sciatic nerve in the pelvis, they've never operated on a, on a peripheral nerve, rarely. So now we're pushing the limits into a new uh, discipline that the radiologist will need to catch up, they'll need to uh, follow up, and it's gonna take some time, but hopefully the advances of, of imaging will continue to at least help 
the clinicians diagnose uh, more and more diseases at an earlier stage. You don't need to do 16 surgery before somebody diagnoses you with something. Can you explain the potential impact of adenomyosis on fertility and pregnancy outcomes and what treatment options are available for patients who wish to conceive? Well, I think if you're willing to spend the whole night with me doing a podcast, uh, I can tell you in depth and details, but I'm going to try to summarize it. Actually, we don't know what type of adenomyosis impacts fertility. We don't know the impact of adenomyosis on fertility. We know some patients with adenomyosis are infertile or have difficulty getting pregnant. Some other patients know. Now, through what we see, most of the time, the subendometrial cyst or the cyst, chocolate cyst, inflammatory cyst closer to the cavity are predictors for impact on fertility more than a focal adenomyosis outside the cavity. Diffuse adenomyosis where it is throughout the whole uterus and the thickness of the uterus and the distortion of the endometrial cavity can impact fertility more than the uh, focal adenomyosis on the outer surface of the uterus or smaller areas of adenomyosis within the uterus, what we call focal adenomyosis. Uh, cystic adenomyosis has been associated more with infertility rather than, uh, you know, thickening simply of the junctional zone. So a lot of things that we poorly really understand. And then we know many times those patients, when they uh, undergo assisted fertility, they could have a, a preparation of their muscle of the uterus with GnRH analog to thin the muscle of the uterus before they transfer the embryo. They do a longer protocol rather than the shorter protocols in preparation before the embryo transfer. So there are a lot of things that uh, plays into the fertility. We know, as a matter of fact, that when fertility is linked infertility is linked to adenomyosis, IVF yield good results, and then IVF, failure of IVF, conservative surgery uh, by removing only the adenomyosis or what we call the OSADA technique, coring the adenomyosis and reconstructing the uterus could increase the fertility by 30 to 50% in some series. But the triage of the patient is the hardest because a lot of the patients we have to rule out associated endometriosis because endometriosis might be impacting their fertility rather than adenomyosis. If it is an isolated case of adenomyosis where they don't have endometriosis, many times I mentioned those subtypes that could affect more fertility. Uh, uh, IVF could breach that infertility part in patient with adenomyosis. And for selected patient, conservative uterine sparing surgery to excise adenomyosis could yield to an increase of 30 to 50% in fertility rate. So for patients experiencing severe pain or other symptoms due to adenomyosis, what are the recommended treatment approaches, both conservative and surgical? I'm going to give you an example to make it more easy. We have medical treatments like progesterone and IUD. For example, a patient diagnosed with adenomyosis, she's 32 years old, no immediate plan for fertility. Uh, she has heavy bleeding as the primary symptom with some pain. She doesn't have associated endometriosis. A marine IUD or a hormonal IUD or a progesterone pill could help managing the bleeding and decreasing the inflammation because the progesterone are anti-inflammatory and can help with the symptomatology of the patient. Now, if patient doesn't want to take any hormonal treatment, conservative surgery, when we cut the uterus, remove the adenomyosis and reconstruct the uterus, are reserved for a selective patient. Not every time I see adenomyosis, I want to remove it surgically because the surgery is, is a complex surgery. It associated with a lot of short-term and long-term complications, and it should not be indicated for patients unless we can link that adenomyosis is causing their fertility issues and IVF 
did not resolve the issue, attempted IVF, or they had a recurrent pregnancy loss, or they had a failure of implantation, then these patients will discuss with them. They will be informed that there is an option of surgical treatment, but this option carries the risk of the surgery and a longer term complication from that. So the treatment of adenomyosis is hormonal. If they want to conserve the uterus, the adenomyomectomy or the OSADA technique is another option for those patients. The definitive treatment is removal of the uterus for patients who do not desire. And then there have been recent uh, devices that were introduced in the market, like the radiofrequency ablation, which were uh, proven for fibroids. They started utilizing them in some center for adenomyosis, but we don't know precisely the shorter term and the longer term impact because we believe they could decrease the bleeding. We don't know anything about the pain, what happens with the pain. And again, the, the, the adenomyosis treatment will become a little bit uh, delicate because as I mentioned, adenomyosis in 40% is associated with endometriosis. So we don't wanna do a treatment for one disease and overlook the other disease or poorly uh, not treat the other disease. So that's why a thorough assessment, a thorough diagnosis, and then discussing all the different options with the patient are the key. We have the question of fertility. Are you interested in future fertility or not? We have the uterus sparing or non-sparing options. We have the medical or the surgical option. So multiple different things could be offered for patients. For patients with uh, bleeding and cramping, uh, with severe bleeding with adenomyosis, there have been patients offered uterine artery embolization to decrease the bleeding, radiofrequency ablation, same thing. There are lots of different therapies. In the past, they did a lot of uh, endometrial ablation or burning the lining of the uterus. I would caution a lot of patients with adenomyosis to do that because sometimes the, the bleeding will stop but the pain will worsen. So it's a good discussion for every patient. They need to be well informed before making any decision when it comes to adenomyosis. And as much as we emphasize on the fact that patients need to see an expert when we talk about endometriosis, it's the same emphasis because surgical uterine sparing technique for adenomyosis even less than uh, surgeons doing deeply infiltrative endometriosis, know how to perform these procedure, know which patients they need to offer. Uh, because at the end of the day, it's not because you can do it, you should do it. The most important thing is to try to utilize the right technique for the patient who benefit from it the most. And I'll give you an example. We talked about 30 to 50% increase in fertility for patients who have adenomyosis-linked infertility. That same percentage will decrease to less than 3% for patients who are more than 40 years old. The same techniques. So that percentage is only for patients who are less than 39 years old. So see if I don't understand the statistics behind, I could elude a lot of patients and rope them to unnecessary, very morbid surgery if we don't give them. Now, if a patient understand that it is 3% or 1% or 2% and they're willing to take that risk and they're willing to go through that route, we, are, we will be more than happy to walk them through that route. But the most important thing is to well inform the patient so they can choose whatever is best for them based on accurate and clear information. Not like, oh, we're going to increase your chance 30 to 50%, but she's 42. No. What new technologies exist for the detection of adenomyosis and endometriosis? Now, new technologies, I think we talked about the radiologic. I think the newer technology that we're starting to discover nowadays for endometriosis and adenomyosis is listening. 
I think that nobody listen anymore to the symptoms of any patient with the modern medicine. So I'm taking advantage of this platform to introduce this new technology that works like a charm for patients with adenomyosis. You have to listen to them, take a good history, take advantages of the newer guidelines for ultrasound diagnosis and MRI diagnosis uh, to help diagnosing. Biopsies for uh, adenomyosis, even though there are some biopsies that could be done via hysteroscopy uh, with, uh, um, with a special smaller device that could take a biopsy, but still, uh, even though biopsy would would diagnose adenomyosis, but I, I don't think we need an invasive uh, treatment to diagnose since we have a non-invasive like the MRI and the uh, history and physical exam uh, diagnosis for adenomyosis. So uh, the surgical innovation, there are a couple of devices that we're working on that could be very helpful for adenomyosis. I cannot disclose any of those, but you'll see them uh, on the market, uh, hopefully in the near future. But until then, that uh, mostly what we know and what we've done is what we discussed, the hormonal uh, progesterone therapy. Some patients are offered the newer medication like the GnRH analog or the Lupron-like or the Orlista-like medications. That's becoming the vogue for a lot of uh, surgeons who do not have the skills or the understanding uh, to deal with these diseases. But uh, again, uh, adenomyosis is still very understudied, very ununderstood, because it's still a major enigma. I, I think uh, we still need a lot of work to understand what can we do for those patients and how we can get them the uh, most appropriate treatment. Uh, but this is what we have until currently right now. So how do you help patients navigate options to find the most suitable management plan? So, you know, uh, for me is options are not vomiting a book chapter because I see, uh, you know, a lot of physicians just tell the patients, oh, you have this, and then these are the treatment, one, two, three, four, five. For me, is you have to target the options for the patient needs. Because at the end, the patient is coming to seek your opinion. She will make the decision, but she needs a realistic understanding of the viable and feasible options that they, they could potentially have a, a meaning for her to improve her quality of life or do something for me. So we discuss, I mentioned other options. I tell the patient, oh, there are medications some people try or Lisa, but you know, we want to give the patient realistic options. And if the patient is interested in any of the option, even if I'm not convinced, let, let's, for example, patients telling me, I want to try or Lisa, this or Lisa. I have to go through the complete understanding of that medication for her so she can understand the impact on the bone density, the impact on the vaginal health, the impact on the night sweats, insomnia. And if they still decide, my job as a physician to educate, to empower, to explain. But if a patient wants to go uh, in a route, if I think it's harmful for her, I can refrain from doing that. The patient could not tell me like, oh, can you throw me? And then this way I will die. I won't have pain. I won't do that. But... <clears throat> But within the reasonable, uh, patients have the right uh, to do things. And if you don't feel comfortable in prescribing anything for the patients or doing anything, you should have the ethical obligation to refer her to somebody else who can take care of her in that sense. But for me, I believe that especially patients with chronic pelvic pain, patients with these kinds of diseases are very intelligent and very clever, and they've done a lot of research. They understand a lot of things. So uh, when you have an honest conversation, you create the patient physician trust. Patient will, will be very easy to work with because they know precisely what they want. They know precisely what they feel. And then they want your expertise, your understanding, your honesty into discussing all these topics. 
I think it's it's extremely delicate to uh, discuss objectively, but I use this term. Targeted therapy are the most important thing for a lot of patients. What is neuropelviology and does it play a role in the treatment of adenomyosis? Well, neuropelviology is a new discipline where there are a lot of nerves in the pelvis. As I mentioned, the pelvis is an extremely complex region and there are a lot of nerves in the vicinity of the organs that we work around, the bowel, the bladder, the uterus, and in the vicinity of the diseases that we treat like endometriosis, adenomyosis. Those nerves could be irritated because of the disease being in the vicinity or in the proximity of those nerves, the inflammation created by the disease that would irritate those nerves or stimulate them, or the scar tissue created by the disease compressing or entrapping their nerve, or the pelvic congestion that is created by the inflammation, the veins that start compressing those nerves, because the nerves, usually every nerve is a, a vein and an artery, most of the time run around them. So if the vein is congested, if there are scar tissue, if uh, there is severe inflammation, all those nerves get uh, stimulated or irritated to produce symptoms. Now, many times diseases like endometriosis could invade deeper in the tissue and could arrive in the proximity or even on the nerve. And then that needs to be uh, treated and excised. With adenomyosis, I believe, in the case of association with endometriosis, endometriosis is the incriminator of the nerve damage rather than adenomyosis. In isolated adenomyosis, the inflammation created by adenomyosis tend to create these problems with the nerve. In addition to that, adenomyosis, the uterus enlarges, it requires a lot of more blood supply, and then the venous, the venous return will be congested that could compress or uh, uh, stimulate nerves uh, when a lot of veins are compressed, like a pelvic congestion syndrome or any of the uh, aberrant venous system like superior gluteal vein syndrome, uh, where the superior gluteal vein compresses the sciatic nerve or the sacral roots. So there are a lot of uh, diseases that are from compression of a nerve, what we call them neurovascular conflict. And adenomyosis could potentially uh, do those either by being associated with endometriosis, either compressing veins, the nerve compressed by veins or the inflammation created by the disease irritating or stimulating the nerves in the vicinity. So what myths and misinformation should patients steer clear of in regards to both adenomyosis and endometriosis? Well, I can tell you something. There are a lot of misinformation out there, and then that's why we continue to do what we're doing, awareness and education. My advice for a lot of patients is not everything you hear or you see, or you read, especially now on social media and internet is correct. I think as much as it is painful that patients have to advocate for themselves instead of trusting the healthcare system. And then it's a, it's a, it's a shared um, responsibility from all of us to rectify what happened to that mistrust or the big gap between patients and the healthcare system uh, because of the past gaslighting, misunderstanding, the uh, volume-based medical system where they're going to rush, the, the lack of appropriate training in a lot of uh, specialty. I think fact-checking everything is very important. Utilizing sources that are trustworthy uh, is important because at the end, the burden of a misdiagnosis is far more affecting patient and their life rather than fact-checking or going seeking an expert opinion. Uh, and that's what I see. There are a lot of uh, myths and 
misconception, erroneous medical information with no scientific basis, a lot of inspirational quotes that is just to, you know, uh, make patients feel good, but they're void of any scientific value. And then on the contrary, they're misleading, they're, they're damaging more rather than helping uh, patients. So I believe fact-checking, uh, uh, seeking uh, correct information, educating yourself, and knowledge is the most powerful tool for endometriosis and adenomyosis patients. And then uh, the most important thing is for them to know that there are a lot of information out there. There are a lot of trustworthy people. There are a lot of you know people who, who strive to pass and send the right message. So they're not alone. They have a lot of options, but you know, the internet, the yellow media, as I call, that wants to attract with big titles and we discover a drug for endometriosis or there's a new drug, all these kind of things. I can tell you that uh, they're very far from reality. Not everything that glitters is gold, Dr. Moad, isn't that right? Even if someone has a megaphone, it doesn't mean that what they're saying is always accurate. Okay. So as a final question, I have a bit of a curveball question for you. We know that endometriosis has been found in all sexes and all genders. We know that I think there's 28 cases of endometriosis in men, in cis men. I'm wondering with adenomyosis, have you heard of any cases either in literature or in your own practice or the practices of your colleagues where you can have intersex patients, so patients that are not biologically male or female, and then also obviously in female to male trans patients as well. So I just want to touch on that, not necessarily in terms of gender theory, but just in terms of biology, that we do have people who, even though, you know, they might have a uterus, there's cases where there's no ovaries or there's sort of different presentations anatomically. So is there anything you can comment on on that and whether there are patients who may not be biologically, whatever that means, but may not be female, but they do have adenomyosis? Have you come across that? We know it happens with endometriosis, but then obviously the uterus, we tend to think of it as a female organ. But then we do have cases of specifically, if we're looking at intersex, and even if we don't look at hormonally, you know, changing our bodies and becoming trans. But if we're just looking at people who don't have a distinguishable features one way or the other. There are a few cases in the literature that uh, describe uh, peritoneal adenomyosis. And that was mistaken as endometriosis or as leomyomatosis, like uh, patients with diffuse fibroids on the peritoneum. But uh, I believe uh, I have never heard about a patient without a uterus having adenomyosis. With a uterus, but perhaps with the without uterus, other distinguishable... Would happen at all time. So if you have a uterus, you can have adenomyosis. Yes. Whether you identify as a female right now, or not, the presence of the uterus could always predispose you at having issues with the uterus, even uh, under uh, severe testosterone therapy. Because for me, a deeply infiltrative of endometriosis, uh, the worst case I've seen were in uh, transsexual patients where they thought like they are on suppression, they don't have any ovaries but they still have deeply infiltrated endometriosis on the bowel. And now with the testosterone, it thins out all the uh, organs and then the surgical uh, part will be technically extremely challenging. Uh, and then same thing with adenomyosis. Adenomyosis, we've, we've removed a lot of uteri for a transsexual patient that uh, on pathology had adenomyosis. So adenomyosis is not only a disease of patients who identify as female, it's a disease that is present in uteri uh, in patient now identifying as male or females. And endometriosis also, 
the uh, removal of the ovary does not preclude the progression of endometriosis because even in males, the fat uh, cells uh, have an, an enzyme called aromatase and they would transfer the uh, male hormone, the testosterone, into a weaker form of estrogen we call estrone. And that estrone continue to stimulate the endometrial-like uh, tissue or endometriosis. And then same thing, if the uterus is filled with glands and stroma, that weaker estrogen continue to stimulate. The endometriosis also tissue uh, have a particular ability to carry this aromatase enzyme within those tissues. So even when patients are at higher doses of circulating testosterone, they tend to create higher doses of weak estrogen that are, could continue to progress endometriosis and adenomyosis. That's why many times even males that are born biologically as male and associate as males, many times when they put weight and they develop uh, uh, gynecomastia, what we call, which is uh, like breast uh, like, and this is because of the increased level of estrone or estrogen, uh, a weaker estrogen that stimulate that uh, kind of formation. Thank you so much for that extremely informative answer, Dr. Moad. So is there anything else you would like to add about adenomyosis, new technologies, or any of the topics we discussed today? No, I think... Uh... This a uh, quick message, fact check, knowledge is power, uh, do your uh, due diligence. Adenomyosis is really scientifically poorly understood, but we have a lot more information every day. So seek the care from somebody who understands the disease. And you have a lot of options. Adenomyosis does not mean hormones or removal of the uterus. There are a huge spectrum of uh, management depending on the symptoms of the patient, depending on the fertility uh, wishes of the patient, depending on maintaining the uterus or not. There are a lot of options for patients and options should not be simplified to as either we remove your uterus or we uh, give you a uh, pill or a hormone or an IED or something like this. Thank you so much for all of your wisdom and all of your information that you shared with us today. Dr. Gabby Moad from the Center of Endometriosis and Pelvic Surgery in the United States. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you so much and I wish you a wonderful podcast.